Hello. Well, we've introduced interfacial tension and contact angle, and we've introduced the young Laplace and the young equations. So now we're going to put everything inside a porous medium, and our exemplar porous medium will indeed be porous rock, like I have in my hand. So let's now zoom into the pore space. Now, of course, I can't do this just on this screen, but with X-ray imaging, we can see inside the pore space of rocks. So it's not a mystery what it looks like. But what I'm going to introduce you to is this concept of pores and throats and topology. And then I'm going to introduce the idea of wettability and how it can vary and change. So imagine we did have a blown up X-ray image of a rock. It's going to be something highly irregular. Sort of like this. But there is something we need to note. So we're going to have wider regions of the pore space, which I'm going to call a pore. And they'll be connected via narrow regions, which I'm going to call a throat. Right? Throat like this, and the pore is like your head and shoulders. And in general, most porous structures can be defined this way. There are wide regions, and then to get to another wide region, there's a restriction. You can imagine this in a granular porous medium, that there's a grain here, and another grain here, and so some grains here that create this pore space. The scales, if we're looking at a porous rock, will be of order about 10 microns, say, would be typically this type of distance. But it could be larger, it could be smaller, depending on the sample. One of the key themes, as we have subsequent videos, will be this concept of a pore, a wide region, and a throat that is a narrow region. So let's try and define that carefully. And we can do this using what's called a distance map. And I'm not going to go through the mathematics in a great deal of detail, but at least give the concept. So you can imagine at any point in the pore space, and this is three-dimensional, okay, I can define a distance d, and it will be a function of x, which is a vector in space, but only defined in the pore space. You can define a distance d, which is the distance to the nearest solid. Okay, so d can be defined everywhere, and it's called the distance map. Up. How do we then define a pore, and how do we then define a throat? Well, a pore centre, the centre of the pore, is clearly a maximum in D. Okay. So what this means is that D is increasing as I go to the centre. It reaches a maximum value which you could imagine I can draw a circle now that will hit in at least two places. So there is a ball that fits in there with this maximum value of D. Okay? So that will define a pore center, and the maximum value here will define the pore radius. But you might say, okay, that's fine. I can imagine this concept of a sphere, in fact, right, fitting in the pore space. And what's the largest sphere I can do? But how do I define these regions and how should I define a throat? A throat, technically, is in fact not a, or an object with volume, but is a surface. And it's defined as a surface such that perpendicular to the surface, D is increasing here, but it increases in the opposite direction, the other side of the surface. And of course, that means that it's moving towards another pore. Right, so we could call this pore one, and this would be pore two. So if you imagine the distance map, if you take this surface here, 
In the plane of the surface, D will change. And in fact, there's a center of a throat and there'll be the maximum value of D, which is actually the throat radius. Okay, so there'll be a radius here of a sphere that just fits in this restriction. But perpendicular to this surface, D is actually increasing. If it's decreasing, well, then there's an even narrower region that I can get into, and that's not the true throat. So the throat is a surface such that in one direction, you move towards the pore center here. As you increase D, it's like walking uphill, and it's a three-dimensional object, so it's a little bit more difficult. Okay, and here you're going uphill to the, the next mountain peak. So you can describe this with a few more equations, but essentially that's the concept. So a pore is defined by its center, which is the maximum of the distance map. You have a throat that is a surface between two pores. So you can associate a region with a pore just by finding all the throats here that surround a pore. So in this case, there will be three restrictions. This volume could be associated with this pore. Then we've got these throat surfaces with their corresponding minimum radii, and then there'll be other pores leading out. So that's the concept of the pore space and what I mean by pores and throats, and we'll be using that concept in subsequent videos. So that's the pore space. We can image it. There are codes that can extract essentially that topology, find the pores, what pores are they connected to via what throat, and then acquire certain properties of the pores and throats that we may need for modeling or analysis. But what about wettability? We haven't uh, got to that yet, have we? So let's now think about what a pore or throat, or indeed any random region of the pore space would look like in cross-section. So imagine now I just take a cross-section. This is a three-dimensional picture. And of course, in cross-section, this can look, you know, it's not going to be smooth. It can be a rather irregular shape. Okay, now I'm going to make a conceptual leap, but one that turns out to be quite important in our understanding, and certainly in our understanding of wettability. So I'm going to conceptually describe this irregular pore shape in cross-section with a triangle. Now that's a big simplification, but it turns out that it's really rather important in one key aspect, which is having corners. So I'm going to draw a triangle here. And it can be a scalene triangle. It doesn't have to be, there's no particular regularity to it. We can define it actually so that it has the same inscribed radius. And we can also define it so that it has the same ratio essentially of the perimeter length squared to the area. That's called the shape factor. But again, that's not really the concern uh, for today's video. Now let's think about fluids within the pore space. So normally we consider this as the solid. So let's make that a little bit more explicit like this. Okay. Okay. And we can imagine a situation where originally the pore space is completely saturated with water. And this is what we encountered deep underground, for instance. It what you see in many other materials that are fully saturated with water. And if, for instance, we are deep underground and we have a carbonate like this, that's chalk. Chalk will soak up water. Okay. If we have uh, a silicate material, a sandstone, for instance, that material is the same as glass. Glass is also water wet. So we'd expect if we had another phase, say a gas or oil, the contact angle would be less than 90 degrees. It would be water wet. So we can imagine a situation where another phase moves into the porous medium. And in that case, and we're going to consider an oil as a sort of exemplar. And so this will be, for instance, when an oil reservoir first forms, oil migrates from the source rock up through the pore space and then collects under an impermeable region. So it fills the pore space. So when it does so, so we'll consider this phase two, Right, be oil in this particular case, what happens? 
Well, we're going to describe this in more detail in a subsequent video, so let's not think too much about it, but that material will move into the pore space. What will be retained in the corners of the pore space is the wetting phase, which in this case is water, phase one. And the contact angle, if we zoom in here, may not be beautifully described, but the contact angle is defined through the denser phase, phase one. So this will be your contact angle theta. And you notice that that contact angle is less than 90 degrees. But in our reservoir, crude oil is a mixture of hundreds of thousands of chemical components. And some of those are surface active. So it shouldn't come as a surprise. You get some oil, you put it on a surface, that surface becomes oily. So what you often find, certainly in an oil reservoir, is that over the geological times that the oil has been sitting there, and experimentally you only have to wait about 40 days, is this surface becomes oil wet, becomes oily. It doesn't have to be like this, but it can be. But this isn't exclusive to oil fields. If we're in the shallow subsurface where there's organic material, there's bacterial action, the organic material, the bacteria, again, create oily type surfaces in the sense that they're not strongly wetting to water. They begin to repel water. They can be hydrophobic. So even now in the deep subsurface with some marine allergies, with some bacterial action, the presence of organic material, it is quite likely that we have surfaces here that do no longer have a strong affinity to water. So to assume that everything is water wet, that this contact angle is always less than 90 degrees is not necessarily correct. So what we can have is we have what we call a wettability alteration. So what does that mean? Well, what it means is that now if I want to inject water, so imagine I'm trying to push the oil out in an oil field with water, so I'm pushing the water out. Or imagine I've injected something into the subsurface, say carbon dioxide, for instance, and now water is displacing that carbon dioxide as the carbon dioxide migrates. In that case, then for water to move across this surface, this contact angle can no longer be less than 90 degrees. In fact, it has to be greater than 90 degrees. The water has to bulge into the oil or the gas. The capillary pressure is actually technically negative in order for the water to displace the other phase. So now we have another contact angle. So this is a little strange. So in fact, we have to define, turns out, three contact angles, and then we'll talk about them in a little bit more detail. We have a theta, which is your receding contact angle, when phase two was displacing phase one. So when the water, the denser phase through which contact angle is measured, was receding. That's called the receding contact. And that receding contact angle is less than what I'm going to define as a hinging contact angle. And then I'm going to have another one here. And let's just define these. Let's just put the annotation on. And then I define what I mean Try all of these. Okay. The receding one is the contact angle when phase two is displacing phase one. Phase one is withdrawing from the porous medium. The hinging angle is, now I've got it, but now I'm going to reverse the process. Okay, I'm going to go the other way. But to do that, the contact angle starts at a low value and has to reach a high value before it starts moving. We call that a hinging angle because nothing's moving but the contact angle's changing. And then eventually it begins to move and that's the advancing angle 
water is advancing and that's a higher contact angle. So let's just show that schematically. So we have a situation here. We have, if we then blow up this interface so that we can see it really clearly, to begin with, okay, we have phase one that's preceding phase two. So we're going this way. This is your theta r. In order to go the other way, because we now stick some oily stuff in here so it doesn't like it, so to go this way, that's theta a, and in between these two, before, and then it starts moving, and then we push out the water, okay? So this is going this way, stop, move, and now it's going, but before it does this, okay, it can be anything in between, and that's your, what's called your hinging angle. So let's just write down this. This is your hinging angle. This is advancing. And this last one is receding. Okay, so that's what we see and it's called contact angle hysteresis. This. So contact angle hysteresis is where when you go one way, it's one angle, it then hinges like a hinge on a door, and then it starts going the other way. Okay, and we see this, the advancing angle is larger than the receding angle. So now we're going to go through in a little bit more detail the reasons why we have contact angle hysteresis. Clearly, the first one is wettability alteration, but that's not the only one. So, contact angle hysteresis. Let's write the equation again. The advancing angle is greater than or equal to the hinging angle, greater than or equal to the receding angle. And there are three reasons for contact angle hysteresis. So the first one we've already met, which we call a wettability alteration. And this really is related to organic material entering the porous medium and sticking to the surface. This could be bacteria, any type of decaying organic material, but classically in an oil field, it's the crude oil moving in and sticking to the surface. And that's possibly the most significant type of contact angle hysteresis that we see. But there are two other reasons. And I just want to go through those and try and go through those reasonably carefully because they sometimes cause confusion. The second one is surface roughness. And the third, which I think if you understand the surface roughness is straightforward, is mineral heterogeneity. Okay, so let's go through the surface roughness argument. So you see this type of contact angle hysteresis, even if there hasn't been a wettability change, on a surface that is rough. Now, if I take a molecularly smooth surface, say a mica surface on which contact angle is traditionally measured, then you can, if you do really careful experiments, find that these three angles are the same. But we're deep underground in porous rock. I'm afraid nothing is smooth. Nothing is smooth, certainly at the molecular scale. So let's imagine a rough surface, okay? Right, paws and throats. But now conceptually, I want to clarify how we're gonna represent this. Because I introduced this idea of pore and throat, and then I said, oh, you've got this very complex pore space, and I'm going to represent it by a triangle. Triangle has smooth sides. So when we conceptually and quantitatively describe flow and pores media, we normally don't describe every single piece of roughness. Indeed, we can't necessarily do that. Even with the best imaging, we can't get down all the time everywhere to the molecular scale 
and describe how every molecule is arranged in the pore space, it's just too complicated. So what we want is we want an idea in an equivalent smooth surface. And in fact, the contact angles I'm now going to talk about are the contact angles actually on an equivalent smooth surface. So let's now explain this. Imagine I have a true contact angle, and if you're a physical chemist, you call this the intrinsic contact angle of 90 degrees. So you might say, well, here, look, I can see this is 90 degrees, and it goes down here at 90 degrees. Here, I can do something like that. Okay, so you can have an interface, and let's have phase one here, and let's have phase two here. Okay, and you can say, yeah, there's a 90 degree contact angle, and you can see sort of consistent with that, it's neither wetting to one or two, you have a flat surface, there's no curvature, the capillary pressure is zero. Okay, fine. Now, let's imagine that we have an advancing angle and then we have a receding angle. So, from the advancing angle, phase one has to displace phase two. But now, well, okay, so it has to actually move. It has to get from here uh, to here. It's not just an equilibrium. It has to uh, get itself across. So as it does that, hang on, you've got a configuration. Sorry, that's not quite right, is it? A configuration at 90 degrees. Okay, here, 90 degrees, we've got something like this. Okay, here, again, we got to bulge out. Now I say, yeah, yeah, but when it comes to here, it does that. Now let's think, what's the most difficult step? The most difficult step, okay, is when the curvature here is the largest and most positive in the sense of one bulging into two. Why is that? From the young Laplace equation, the pressure difference between the two phases is related to the curvature. So if I have phase one and I keep increasing the pressure in the pump in one, at what pressure can I move across? Well, here it goes the other way. Actually, phase one could be at a lower pressure than phase two. So that's the easy bit. This is the difficult bit. Here, where it has to bulge out. So how do I describe this with equivalent smooth porous medium? When I extend this, and what I see here is what I call the advancing angle. So yes, the intrinsic angle is 90 degrees. But if I were to describe this, and I describe it in a model, and actually even with fancy imaging and experiments, I cannot see down to the molecular level actually see this, what I appear to see is a smooth surface, certainly at the scale of a few microns, which is my imaging resolution, or the resolution at which I'm describing pores and throats, with an effective contact angle that's much greater than 90 degrees. Now, let's do the process in reverse. Phase two is pushing phase one, when I've already drawn it. Right. The most difficult step is like this, okay, where it's bulging out. Here, now I need a higher pressure in phase two. This is the easy bit. Phase two goes easily there, but this is most difficult. And remember, my contact angle is measured through phase one. So this is my receding angle, which is lower. So when phase one displaces phase two, I get a high contact angle. When phase two displaces phase one, I've got a low contact angle. And both of those actually mean that for phase one to displace phase two, I need a higher pressure in phase one. And for phase two to, to, to go the other way around, I need a higher pressure in phase two. So it's difficult both ways. And that's how it works. So when we're looking at flow in porous media, displacement in porous media, it's the most difficult step that caps. And that's true of any activity. I want to get from A to B, okay? 
The easy bits are the easy bits. The limiting bit is the limiting bit, and it's exactly the same in multiphase flow and porous media. So this is the other reason for contact angle hysteresis is surface roughness. Yes, at the molecular scale, we have a contact angle, but its effective value is going to make it difficult. The roughness bouncing up and down the roughness, sometimes it helps, but sometimes it hinders, and it's the hindering that matters. Which then gets to the third one, mineral heterogeneity. Obviously, the surfaces, they can be uniform like this. They can all be calcite or they could all be uh, silica. But often you have a mixture of mineralogies and they naturally have different wettabilities. And hopefully you can now begin to see that if I replace this with an equivalent sort of homogeneous region, right? So I say, well, here, you know, I've just got a contact angle. Again, we're going to see contact angle hysteresis. So if I sort of take in the plane here and look at what the surface might be. So imagine I look at a surface and imagine here are patches that are hydrophilic or water wet. Okay. Right, like this. And the rest of them is not. It's more hydrophobic or oil wet. Again, if I want to inject phase one here, when it goes over the hydrophilic regions, the contact angle is going to be very low. That's great. That's easy. But I've got to go through the regions it doesn't like. So the contact angle is going to be large. On the other hand, if I've got phase two, okay, it likes filling these regions, but now it gets limited by the water. So it can't invade those so easily. So again, you get contact angle history. And if you're sort of getting in a model about it, it's just, it's difficult both ways because these, this is easy for one, this is easy for two, but you always have to do the difficult bit. Okay, so that's introduced porous media and it's introduced the idea of contact angle and particularly this idea of contact angle hysteresis. And the two most important concepts, really the first two here, is the fact that organic material can stick to surfaces that might naturally be water wet, but they make them water resistant. Should be noticed notice this with clothing. If they're sort of waxy or oily, they will resist water. And the other is surface roughness. When we try and describe processes at a scale, we rarely get down to the molecular level. And so this surface roughness actually induces effectively some contact angle hysteresis. Thank you very much.